such a pleasure to be here uh, just for this, this wonderful occasion of honoring uh, Dr. Thomas Francis' legacy and then also the incredible work of Dr. Tedros. And I'm excited also to be joined by some colleagues in, in public health from other academic institutions. In the case of uh, Maureen, uh, interesting shared history here that we're celebrating the, the uh, history of uh, Dr. Thomas Francis, but of course, Jonas Salk, who Thomas Francis trained, uh, ended up going to Pittsburgh, where, where Maureen is dean. So there's a bit of shared history there. And then uh, for Moise, we were colleagues together at, at Columbia for, for several years. So, uh, and then of course, our, our own fabulous uh, Bramar. Uh, so I, I wanna start just by talking about how our field has shifted over the last few years. And the pandemic opened the eyes of many just to the field of public health, uh, even if, you know, ways that are more narrow than uh, what our field actually addresses. Uh, you know, I think there's much broader awareness and consciousness about public health. And so uh, I want to uh, ask, and, and, and this is at an important time in society where there's a, um, a framing or an understanding of broader societal issues as public health problems in many cases. So issues around gun violence, for example, issues around climate uh, and health, uh, you know, that these are, are, are being more broadly and widely understood as uh, problems that would benefit from public health leadership. So the first question that I'd like to ask for each one of the, the panelists, can you each start by talking about how you've experienced or witnessed this shift? And then do you approach your work differently now that we have this broader awareness of public health? Maureen? Yeah. Uh, so let's see if I get this correctly. Can you hear me? Um, you know, I knew we had a shared history, um, but it's pretty close, actually. Uh, as we're celebrating our 75th anniversary, you're celebrating um, Thomas Francis and, of course, Dr. Tedros. In a way, there was a shift, and in another way, there wasn't. Because we have to, it's, it's like not learning the lessons, unlearning the lessons we've learned. Um, we know that if we protect the most vulnerable among us, we protect all of us. And yet, we didn't do that during COVID. We're not doing that currently during climate, uh, climate change. Um, we know that we've learned lessons after every disaster, and yet we're not investing in disaster preparedness. We know that the three lessons we've learned are training, a diverse public health workforce, communicating risk effectively, and addressing and investing in the public health infrastructure. We didn't do any of that. Uh, we didn't do it during COVID. We're not doing it currently during climate and health. So what's different? Um, well, I started my deanship uh, at Pitt on January 4th, 2021, and I was the only one in the building. It's tough to steer a ship if you can't talk to people. And so um, the IT group, uh, those in the back of the room and those who are um, sharing the live stream, making the live stream possible, became my best friends because those are the ones that connected me with the Pitt family. And so that was a change. Um, but it really gave me even more resolve to support the public health infrastructure, the work that um, Matt um, and I have done and devoted our lives for so many decades. That means growing that public health workforce, not only qualitatively, competency-wise, but quantitatively, looking closely at how we function, whether it's in a university or in a World Health Organization. And then thirdly, and very importantly, and, and, and Bramar, I'm sure we'll talk about that, see what we do with data, and that data are not for us to keep, but to disseminate and to make a difference in people's lives. So let me stop there. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and congratulations to Tedros. Um, th that's interesting because um, what you said in, in your question um, is so important about the issues of climate change, the issues of uh, violence. What I saw also, it happened with COVID, is that it became identity politics. 
And where, in effect, as you correctly said, those are public health issues. Those are issues that affect the health of the public. Um, whether it's climate change, whether it's, um, whether it's gun violence. Having said that, so I, I was reminded of that, how important it is, and the role, perhaps, of public health to be that arbiter above and throughout those policies. At the same time, we also know that um, every time there is a change introduced, even before COVID, seat belts, we were young enough to remember that when seat belts were introduced, that was a very big thing. Why, why should I deprive myself of my liberty in my own car for which I paid with something around me? So there is hope. The other thing I learned probably was uh, the value of uncertainty and, and the perception of uncertainty because there's been a lot of mixing up between what we think and what we know. And a lot of public health, or not necessarily public health, but interventions publicly have been that. And for the public, it can be, it can be confusing. So the value of communication, I've really learned that, and uh, WHO <laughs> knows more about that. And, and perhaps one, one and a half other points, which is that we are essential in public health. Vaccines are important. Vaccines are essentials. But vaccines don't save lives. Vaccination programs do. We can have the best vaccine on shelves. They don't save lives. Vaccinations do save lives. And at the same time, all of this embedded in our value system. Sometime, and I'll end with that, with all the, the policies and politics that have been in, of in, in COVID, I ask myself, without knowing the answer, what if COVID had affected kids rather than older people? What if it were two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, seven-year-old who were dying rather than older people? Would the response to the policies without putting value on them have been the same? And that's a question we can only answer with values. So I, I'll just stop there, just, just simple. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to represent uh, the Vice Statistics Department in the School of Public Health, and welcome to our guest, distinguished guest. Um, and uh, Dr. Tedros was so phenomenal in a morning panel that I'm still in awe. And he explained data better than me. Uh, but I, 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 I just uh, want to say that there has been a complete shift. I took this question very personally uh, because I grew up in a mathematics culture, and you become a mathematician because you don't like people. Uh, <laughs> so I was very happy with pen and paper, right? In, 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 even in the school of bi public health, biostatisticians are considered as a different kind of species. Uh, and so I, I, I feel that it has completely transformed me. I was traveling in India, and uh, somebody came in in transportation in the airport and said, are you Bromar Mukherjee? And I was just shocked. Uh, I was on the TV a lot, and this person asked me, I just wanted to thank you for your work because I used your models to keep my parents safe and decide when they should travel. And so that gave me a realization, a deep realization of the impact that you could have in terms of reaching the public. So I feel like I'm pursuing more impactful work rather than incremental work. And some of my colleagues in the department are saying, Brumar, you're going to not prove any theorems anymore. 
And so I, I, I am really, really deeply proud of the work that we are doing with colleagues here, in particular, a new cohort study called My Cares with many of my colleagues sitting here, where we are building a cohort of 100,000 uh, Michiganders aged 25 to 44 and collecting longitudinal data uh, on environmental markers and oversampling six environmental injustice hotspots. So you always hear biostatisticians are working on the backyard, everybody's backyard, but to be involved in collection of data you're sort of referees, oh, you're not doing this right? Well, this is bad, but why don't you play in the field? Why don't you gather and collect data? Why don't you define your work with more purpose and priorities? So that has become very important to me. The second thing I'll mention is communication. You know, I am an immigrant scientist. My native language is not English, but I really realize the importance of public health communications and how you earn trust by effective communications and also always speaking the science. So I did a fellowship in last uh, fall in University of Cambridge to improve my communication skills. I have to be better. And the other thing which I've really enjoyed is this pandemic has opened up as an educator, global corridor for education. Now it's possible for me to use Zoom and talk to a high school girl in India and tell them about biostatistics and what a wonderful future can await for them. And so in my work as chair, it has also influenced me because I think academia makes you focus too much on your CV because you have to get tenured. So I feel like there is more, we need more liberation from metrics. And I want to encourage my faculty to pursue scholarship and impact, and the metrics are derivatives of that. And I also want to say that I will try to be an incisive scientist and an inclusive leader. Wonderful words from each of you uh, that I think stress really, really important issues, uh, you know, the, the, the least of which is really targeting impact with our work. And in higher ed, we have to embrace that as an opportunity, as a challenge to evolve how we've done things. And we've always had impact. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying that from a critical view, but trying to maximize the impact that we have and the positive uh, contributions that we make to society. So Maureen, uh, I'm going to come back to you. Your background is in environmental public health, and you're well aware of public health implications of, of climate change. What are some of the most pressing things that you think we need to be doing in the short and long term to address the public health impacts of climate change? I'm glad we're turning back to actually public health's greatest threat. We will deal with pandemics. They will come and go. Um, we're not too late. Uh, in the middle of November, I was uh, interviewed because we reached, we, the world, reached 8 billion people and said, well, what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night are four things, and they're all related to climate and health. One is air quality. Two is food security and water security or insecurity. Three are infectious diseases. And four is heat. And so let me begin with the last one. Um, Heat impacts directly people who are already suffering from cardiovascular disease. And those are the people that we forget because they're in nursing homes. Those are the people that we forget because they're homeless. Uh, and yet not all cities have ways to provide um, cooling centers, for example. Not now during the snow, but um, when we need them. Um, air quality. The pollu air pollution from us in the North impacts kids' asthma in the South, in lower and middle income countries, where disproportionately uh, the impact is compared to the resources they have to address those. Infectious disease, um, I don't know whether you know it, but mosquitoes, no, no borders. And so um, the, the, the amount and the magnitude to which we um, intrude into their environment, this is the one health component of climate and health, the more their mosquitoes are coming to us, but we're actually going to them. So it's, it's almost like a two-way street. And then we're surprised when we have dengue in the south of our country, right? Um, 
and food security or insecurity and water insecurity. There are whole water wars going on around the world. Um, but I worry that when we have more flooding, um, agricultural lands become less productive, that increases the use of pesticides we talked about before, and that decreases um, um, the nutritional components of fruit and vegetables for kids. It increases uh, malnutrition in pregnant women and in kids. So those are the things that keep me up at night. We'll, we'll go to Moise now uh, for a question, uh, kind of returning, there were some comments on, on data. Uh, you know, we now have the technology and capabilities to amass and to integrate and analyze really large data sets. And this makes it easier for us to understand how different public health issues might overlay one another and impact communities simultaneously. You know, we also have increase in analytic methods, and that's you know, statistical methods, machine learning, but also things like artificial intelligence. In what ways do you see data and these new technologies impacting our ability to address global public health issues? Yeah, that, that's, those are very important. And, I, and I, will, I will repeat your term, so a mass analyze and integrate, because the three aspects are important. Because, so to a mass, First of all, we live in a, in a world that's very different from any before us. We used to say, until recently, oh, we don't have data on that. We don't have data. Now, we have data. So we went from a paucity of data world to an overabundance of data world. We have data we didn't even think we could have. We have health data. Naturally, when we think in health data, we're thinking electronic health records, EHR, et cetera. But not only that, and we have a lot of that, but we also have data that was not even collected for health. Um, today, I looked up because I went on a run this morning and I was thinking of biking and I saw that there was Arbor bike, but some people told me, well, it's not a good idea. So I, I didn't do that. But those are data. City bike in New York, uh, Vélib in Paris, um, Santander in London. Those are data that are not collected for health. But if you rent a bike at 10, 12 AM, at 10, 46, you put it in a different place. I know exactly where you went. I know the distance that you ran, that you rode the bike. I know how long it took you. I know the elevation. I can compute your MET. I can compute your energy expenditure. And we have a lot of data like that. I can embed the medical data into the census tract, as we know. So we have both an expansion of the data into the embedding an expansion of the data into data that were not collected for search. And in addition to that, now on the other side, we have a precision of data, the epigenetics that we can actually, get. that's the whole issue of precision health. To amass, all of that with the ability to analyze in a way that was not um, possible before. But all of what I say about in my view, there's also some warnings that come with it, because it may give us a sense false of security, a sense false of knowing all we know. We don't. We will know things that we, will, we never knew, but we'll know because we looked places we would never look. Because not only we have more data, but we have the timing all the time that Apple Watch knows my heart rate all the time. That never happened before. You used to go to the doctor twice a year or whatever it is and you had your heart rate. But because the people who have the watch are also the better off, the new normal is also the normal of the better off. When we get the impression that we are actually being equitable, we may actually be exacerbating disparities, which is, the principle of fundamental prevention, as, as we know about, that every time there's a new technology coming in, the risk is 
that the better off are going to be the first ones to actually benefit from it uh, before the other one. And then, so those are the warnings, the illusion of fairness uh, that, that, that we're talking about. And I also want to put it uh, in the context of belief, because we cannot separate it, it seems to me, from the, our beliefs. Who owns our data? Who owns our data? In the last 20, 30 years, we've basically given it up to private companies, basically. That's been kind of an informal deal. But now that that data, the health aspects and the embedding and the precision is becoming so much, the issue of belief with AI, which I'm sure you had in your, in your mind in the question, the issue of beliefs becomes very important. Who owns that data? There is an opportunity for those data to impact. I don't want to bash data. It wouldn't be good, it would take us out of business, but there's an opportunity. The way cell phones have penetrated in the global south, places where telephone lines have never been. So there is an opportunity. But why we need to be very conscious that we also have to be conscious that we may exacerbate disparities with the impression that we're being fair. That, and that, that is uh, probably, uh, uh, I want to say one last thing for WHO because I think, <laughs> well, sorry, tell us. data, for example, in Haiti, there was, uh, there was um, w when there was earthquake, data can allow a very quick response. So I tend to, I tend to separate the two with the emergency response as opposed to the, to the, to the chronic day-to-day -day response in terms of the think of data. I hope we'll come back to this, the issue of data. Uh, yes, we will spend, we will spend some okay. time uh, on, on data, including the next question to Bramar. But, okay. but if, if you want to make a quick comment, please do. I actually have a couple of thoughts and questions myself as a follow-up. So okay. we'll, you know, we'll have some other things to, to, to cover, but if you want to, uh, to uh, follow up with I the comment. I want to make sure that when we talk about data, we value in the same way the data that we're collecting by the data that the communities are collecting. So I want to make sure that locally collected data are pivotal and have the knowledge, just like when I went um, shrimping um, with the Vietnamese uh, fishermen uh, after the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, I knew what they ate. They didn't eat what was on the market. They ate the bycatch. Had I not known that, I would not have analyzed the bycatch. So we need to value locally citizens collected data as we value data that comes out of the electronic health record. Wonderful. Uh, so, so I'll move in the interest of time to Bramar with the next question. Uh, during the pandemic, you used your skills and did a pretty abrupt pivot uh, to leverage your expertise as a, uh, a biostatistician to start modeling COVID projections in India. And you did this, you know, to try to help and inf help inform the country in terms of how to respond, but also to arm uh, citizens of, of India with uh, information, real-time information that they could use as you illustrated in your, in your story. And, and so um, this is, I think, a powerful example of translating one's expertise to impact in, in the role of modeling and data. As you think broadly about pressing issues in global public health, are there specific opportunities you see for leveraging data and statistical modeling to address these topics? Thank you so much for that question. But I also want to say that the work was done that was done during the pandemic was a collective work. It was done by many people in this room. And uh, you never asked me why I'm not doing my job. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Uh, so I, I, I think that culture and courage uh, trumps everything. 
And I think we have that in University of Michigan and School of Public Health in particular, so I really appreciate that. Uh, but in terms of thinking, I think that, for example, I think we had great models, we had great modelers, we had great science, but we certainly did not fare as well because we did not really earn public trust in science and in politics. It got became very, very divisive. So I've been thinking about this, that how to incorporate uh, public trust into mechanistic models of disease transmission. How do we measure trust? Are there data sets which actually measure trust? And it turns out, if you talk to human behavior uh, people and political scientists and even economists, they will tell you that there is a lot of questionnaire data available. So right now I'm involved in a project where we are looking at world value survey, where we are trying to measure trust at a community level, at a country level, and incorporating that into a system of differential equations. And I, as a scientist, I always think about big data as genomics. I think about big data as sequencing vaccine, tremendous progress, but I have always undermined the value of these more abstract things, purpose, meaning, coherence, trust. And these are incredibly important for effective public health uh, policy making, but also to understand the models. A model for virus transmission is not going to give you the effective of a policy intervention if you do not incorporate these things in the model. So how to really think, bring these two worlds together has been really a fascinating journey since the pandemic. And the other thing I would like to mention is that access to data. So electronic health record data, real world data, I think this is very empowering and we really should have methods that can do justice to the data. During COVID, we had to tap onto the electronic health record data and electronic medical record data at Michigan because there was no time to do population-based studies. So to have appropriate methods appropriate study designs to really harmonize and utilize this data in a meaningful, cogent way is incredibly important. And I'd say that sometimes I feel uh, my degree is in classical biostatistics in 2001. I'm antediluvian. Am I going to lose this my job to these machine learners and AI people? And I felt that there is something that I can bring to the table during COVID, which is classical epidemiology and biostatistics in terms of study design, in terms of matching, stratification, confounding. If you don't think these principles into account, no fancy machine learning algorithm can rescue you from bad data. Let me go live stream and emphasize that. And so I, I, I just think that the, if you have exclusionary cohorts, if you have biased data, if you keep collecting data on the same people, which I saw in India, most of the data come from urban areas, then the invisible are always going to remain invisible and never heard. And this is going to reinforce itself iteratively. So sampling and population-based study design is something that I think we know. I also think that chat GPT cannot help us with interventions and understanding mechanisms. So I think that I, I, I see this tussle between big data and sampling, and I want to contribute to that because I'm very excited and sometimes we do not have any choice in a time of imminent crisis to do population-based studies, but we must do better in analyzing this data. Yeah, so I think that's a, a, a good place that I'd ask to um, have you elaborate a little bit more if you have further thoughts for any of you. And, you know, Moise, you, you mentioned issues around equity, uh, depending on what data are available and on whom. And, it, you know, implicit in some of Bramar's statements, the next steps of, well, those are the data that will be analyzed. Those are the data that will... Uh, um, find their way into automated decision tools. And so there are layers of potential bias that, you know, I worry about, you know, once they're fully baked, uh, difficult to even know they're there, yet very influential in terms of policy and decision making. And so, you know, what's the way forward? How do we make, how do we ensure that we don't find ourselves, you know, just entrenched with that kind of inequity or, or bias? No, you, um, yeah. Yeah. You 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 are touching the the core of, of the issue because um, even what's normal, the new normal, those data collected are gonna give us the new normal. 
when we even simple thing like a value, a laboratory value, we say the, it falls outside the range. But it's not ever been a range collected on 100 sample or 1,000 or 10,000 samples on somebody alive in their lives or a million people. We might discover that some values are abnormal, but they're not necessarily abnormal. It's just that we never looked so much so often, and we never saw them before. But if we keep doing it, and that's kind of what we are saying, among the privilege only, or mostly, that normal is biased. And we have the illusion that it's not. Because, oh, we have a million people. I'm just making that up. You know? So, so I, I would say the first thing is to be conscious and humble about, about it. The second thing is to actively, rather than passively, go after it. Oversampling, like you were, do, like you were doing in your, in, in your study. Go after it. It's not enough, for example, smoking. It's not enough to say, well, we, talk, we, we have campaign uh, against smoking, and we tell everybody that smoking is bad for you. That's not enough. What's happening right now, for example, in the US, is that there's a very big social gradient. The poorer you are, the more minority you are, the more you are likely you are to, to be smoking. 50 years ago, it was the reverse. Smoking was a behavior. Look at Hollywood movies. Everybody was smoking. It was the reverse. So the second thing is to actively do for it. The third thing is the technology. Some technology is already biased. We all know about the pulse oximeter and about melatonin and skin color. But did we have to wait for COVID? To actually do that, to actually, so the normal was already baked into the system. So the pulse oximeters were already not uh, collecting uh, Asian, Latinos, and black skin correctly. They were underestimating. They were overestimating the, the oxygenation. So underestimating the underoxygenation. So which delayed treatment. Uh, during COVID. There's a paper that actually showed that. But did we have to wait to have a pandemic to look at that? It's amazing that even the process of licensing didn't have that. So we are at a time, it seems to me, right now, where, as you were saying also, the data are collected in different places. We don't even need to move the data anymore. We can do a federated platform with analysis. But who's going to do the analysis? Who's going to care about the people who don't have the data and who, and who matter? So I have to disappoint you that I don't know the full answer to that. But you're absolutely right. We need to be um, conscious of that. Absolutely. All the people in this room will work very hard on solving that issue. <laughs> so I, I'm going to ask one last question for members of the panel, and then we'll have some time to open it up to get some, some audience questions. Uh, and Maureen, you, you actually touched on the importance of considering community. Uh, and, and so in the field of public health, you know, we work to serve communities, but we also have to understand them and we have to know how to partner with them effectively in order for our work to ultimately be successful. And I'd, I'd just like to ask each of, your, each of you to comment on you know, what you've learned about working and partnering with communities and then what principles in this area are most important for public health scholars, researchers, and students to keep in mind. So we have a responsibility to all of the students who are here, for those of you who are students, actually to all of us, because in a way, we're all students. Um, I, I want to pick up on the data piece. When we went fishing uh, with the Vietnamese fishermen uh, when I was in, in New Orleans, um, there were... Um, they were risk assessors, let me put it that way, I'm, I'm being diplomatic, uh, who were using a certain equation 
to uh, determine how, what the contamination was that um, the, the Vietnamese fishermen would eat um, based on the, the amount of shrimp that they ate. And if you use that equation, that was the norm, um, it turned out to be 13 grams or four uh, shrimp. Uh, upon which a, a very quiet uh, fisherman stood up. He was he was, you know, walking back and forth in the in the back of the room, and he said, "Do you mean for pounds of shrimp? Because that's what we put on our gumbo, and that's what we put on our po' boy, not for shrimp." And so, if you had used the normal data, you would have never known the amount of contamination or the amount of that would eat. So. Community partnerships are only real, uh, I mean, we teach that, but are only real if we invest in it. So, uh, and investing it doesn't mean we ask for a letter of su support for the, at the 11th hour when we submit our grants. Uh, we don't invest and we pull out of the community when we don't have money, right? It, it means that when we say citizens community engaged, we mean community engaged. When we say citizen science, we value and make partners, whether we work with community health workers in our research team, they're not the edit piece. And so what do we need to do? We need to invest in making, just like the 10 essential services, I actually could see how well education is going here and ask your students what the 10 essential services are, but I won't do that because I know they, they, they learn that. I am advocating that we elevate community resilience as one of the essential services so that we invest in a positive way and in a proactive way rather than coming in reactive when the, the, the bad thing has already happened. And so please join me in that advocacy. I, I, I completely agree, um, even though I'm allergic to shellfish and therefore to shrimp. Uh, so, um, <laughs> yes. Um, no, community and community, both local and global. Um, th there's a term that others and myself have used, which is the risk of data colonialism. And that's a, that's a real risk. Um, and not just the data, the producing of the data, but the analysis of the data, because it's power in the end. It is power. And, uh, and it's not just global. It can be, it is global, but it is also global, to use the term that has been uh, often, often used. So that, that world, all exciting, also has, I submit, its own dangers and pitfalls. Um, the management that we do of it, even with ChatGPT and its <laughs> limitations, um, because I think AI is here to stay. You know, nobody's gonna, it's not gonna go away. So we have to really try to figure out what makes us different. It's interesting. The 20th century has been a world of specialization. The global health professional, the, med, the general doctor, didn't disappear, but pretty much, and the specialization has been the world. Now, with the new data, we can have data not just on one specialty. We can have the same data on different the, the same data on different aspects, we have an opportunity to have the data on the person, including where she lives, including the air quality, including the social aspects. And AI has that possibility of really embedding that person into that world on different times. Then AI does it better than you. It has a possibility of doing that technical part better than us. The emotions stay with us. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit like a full circle uh, that, 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 that we've been going to. 
So I, I would I would take a very again personal take on this as a biostatistician and data scientist. So I think this is a momentous time for us in public health and everybody's engaged in public health. We are seeing unprecedented amount of applications to data science and biostatistics. Um, even my parents who never cared about what we do, uh, uh, what I do, uh, are asking me, can you please explain efficacy versus effectiveness? So I think that, that we have come a long way. Uh, so I, I, I think that for me, uh, the theme of equity across methods, across machine learning, through environmental injustice, through understanding structural segregation and discrimination is becoming very important. And I really thank my colleagues in School of Public Health. They made me a human from a biostatistician. So I, I, I really like, you know, they taught me these translation piece. Uh, I, 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 I really think that, and I, I look at this room, I look at my years of my collaborators who have taught me social sciences and environmental health sciences. So I feel very grateful for that education. And so I, I want to really dream of a global data platform and I'm going to put Dr. Tedros on the spot that I think institutes like WHO, World Bank, UN, they have a lot of power in creating accessible, shareable, global data platform because we have seen that the United States has a very disintegrated national data ecosystem. Uh, countries like UK where there is a national health system, Denmark where there is a population-based registry, Israel which has a, a medical insurance uh, company which really is proactive in terms of sharing data, the Clalit Health Services, they all have done and made foundational observations which had helped the rest of the world, be it discovery of a new variant or waning effect of a vaccine. So I want every country to have that kind of data. I'm a data dreamer, but I'm not the only one. And then the second thing I want to say is that, uh, again, this goes back to public trust because I, I, I really thought about big data as a much more esoteric uh, genomics and you know sequencing and all of electronic health records, all of that. But a human's existence cannot be codified just with that. I have come to that realization that we need human flourishing programs trying to really understand uh, mental health, the root cause of addiction, substance abuse. Uh, I was on the National Academy uh, of Medicine Committee on Midlife Mortality, and I realized that even with all of this data, if we do not understand why, we are not going to be successful. And the other thing I want to say is that um, I really think integration of social sciences and humanities into public health and medicine could go a long way. Um, in, in, during COVID, we did a lot of things. We did vaccines, but we could not somehow elevate people's spirit. And when people were singing in their balconies or listening to a concert, I really want to see that. I want to see translation of cells to society, of humanities to public health. I want a big data musical. All right, thank you very much for those comments. We're gonna actually transition now to audience questions. Bramar, you have to be careful putting Dr. Tedros on the spot because I'm gonna go to him for first question. So he may in turn put you on the spot. Uh, but Dr. Tedros, I'd like to just turn it over to you if you have thoughts or uh, comments or a question for the panel. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I, I can comment later, but um, maybe if uh, no, I, I have one question and maybe I will uh, give some thoughts on some issues. Um, you know, the first question you asked was, was very, very important, especially on how public health is being perceived now. Um, I think many are starting to understand, uh, but I don't think uh, it's, it's, it's enough. Uh, I think public health is getting more uh, prominence now. Many are understanding it, but still uh, it needs a very sustainable, um, what do you call it, uh, fight in order to make sure that people understand. One thing we're asking now, member states, all countries, to focus on or to make a shift is to make a shift into promoting health, and that's public health. 
Um, as you know, health is not made in hospitals or clinics. It's actually made in our homes, in our schools, in supermarkets. Uh, because if we can address the root cause of problems in the food we eat, in the environment we live in, the air we breathe, uh, and you can imagine, uh, you know, the impact of it. So um, in one of the major shifts now we are proposing to member states is one is promoting health, and for that to happen, investing in primary health care is very important because if you're talking about public health, if, it, if you're talking about promoting health, preventing a uh, disease or preventing a problem from, from happening, then you will need institutions that will focus on that and the best would be the uh, primary health care. And we say community engagement and it's primary health care best suited to uh, engage communities because to have trust from communities there should be a constant engagement with with communities and it's through primary health care strong primary health care that we can do this so one shift is promoting health the second shift is investing in that vehicle that will help us to promote to promote uh, health uh, so um, I'm, I'm glad you you focused on that uh, but uh, I think that that's, that shift is going to be really crucial. Then we have been, <laughs> you know, the hostages of this virus and um, uh, still, of course, in the middle of the pandemic. And public health and primary health care, again, is important for emergency preparedness and response. Because as you know, primary health care is the eyes and ears of the health system. And you can prevent uh, outbreaks from happening using primary health care by engaging communities, empowering communities. But at the same time, you can early detect because information comes through the primary health care. Um, and whether it's promoting health or a shift to promoting health or a shift to investing in public health, um, it's the same advice, whether it's for high income country, middle income country or low income country, because as you know, during this COVID pandemic, even the countries who believe the wealthiest uh, were surprised uh, because they uh, the, have not invested in public health. They have not invested in, in primary health care. Uh, imagine the um, many of the high income countries couldn't even uh, do contact tracing. While we do contact tracing in DRC, thousands of them a day in Ebola, where there is a security uh, challenge, while in stable countries, high-income countries, where you have all the resources you need, because they have unlearned that, <laughs> what do you call it? They unlearned it, yeah, unlearned it, and the public health infrastructure, then they were surprised. So when we say a shift to promoting health and a shift to uh, primary health care, uh, it applies, I think it should apply all over the world. So that's a very important issue you raised, uh, Dean. Uh, and then um, the other uh, issue maybe um, you raised also is on, um, and that was discussed by the, the panel is, uh, what, what keeps uh, her at night, uh, I think, uh, the Dr. Uh, Lichveld? Yes. <laughs> Maureen is perfect. Maureen, okay. <laughs> okay. By the way, uh, Pete is 75, WHO is also 75. So we're celebrating our anniversary same same time, 75th anniversary. We may need to join forces. We should. <laughs> so what keeps me at night, if I say on one, Still, it's a pandemic. It could be the pandemic due to coronavirus or a flu, uh, because we, we're not ready yet. Uh, Bahramar asked us earlier in the panel uh, to rank our preparedness level, global preparedness level for emergency uh, preparedness. And uh, uh, I said maybe four out of 10. 
because we st I still believe that we are not prepared, and that still keeps me w awake at, at, at night. And I even told her that even the four out of ten is an average. And I told her a story when I was a minister. There was a meeting I attended at the provincial level, and the provincial governor was, uh, you know, sharing the um, provincial uh, level achievements in terms of water and sanitation, in terms of health and so on. And when we, when he reported about water, he said our province now has 80 percent achieved 80 percent safe water. Then. Uh, one uh, district governor said, uh, he stopped him. Stop, stop, I have a question. Where did you bring this 80% from? <laughs> no, I said it's average, but our our district is only 20%. And this guy repeated again and said, no, no, but this is the average for the province, so your district could be 20%, but at the provincial level we have 80%. Then this district governor was really angry and said, we don't drink the averages. <laughs> so you have to, the reason why I'm raising this is, even if I say four out of 10, some countries could be one, completely unprepared. And as I said earlier in the morning, we are as strong as the weakest link. So even if we have average 80, if we have others at the tail end and only prepare 10% or 20%, then globally, as a global community, we are vulnerable. And we have reason to really worry and to believe that we are unprepared. And then the other thing that worries me, especially towards our lack of preparedness is, if we are going to prepare, we have to learn our lessons properly. But I don't think we have learned our lessons properly. Given the discussions I see in the negotiations for the pandemic accord, the pandemic accord uh, should be an instrument that will help us to include everything based on the lessons our, uh, we learned and to prevent the same mistake from happening again in the future. If we fail to include all the solutions to prevent the same mistake from happening in the future, I don't think we will forgive ourselves and I don't think our kids and grandkids will forgive us for that. So we have to be honest. If there was a mistake in equity, and there was, there was vaccine nationalism, there was greed, unless we address that in the pandemic accord, we will make the same mistake of greed and national vaccine nationalism, no equity, lack of equity, and people will die. As simple as that. If we don't address the equity issue, the equity issue could be through this, you know, uh, IP waiver and, and, and so on. Of course, the private sector should be protected. But when there is unprecedented condition, there are ways, there should be ways to uh, use whatever means you have while still incentivizing the private sector. For instance, on the IP waiver, intellectual property waiver, what WHO proposed was since this pandemic is unprecedented, it's happening in 100 years, and we have a provision, let's apply it now. But in order not also to uh, undermine the incentives that the private sector uh, needs, we can use the waiver, limited supplies, and for a short period. That will be a balancing act. Otherwise, if we cannot use the IP waiver now during unprecedented condition, why did we have it even as a provision and negotiated some years ago as Do in Doha? It doesn't make any sense. Why did we even negotiate and why do we have it if we can't use it now? Would we be in this condition all, you know, every now and then? This is, uh, I hope, unprecedented and some, so, something that happens rarely. So that's why I think we have to, to be honest, all of us, <laughs> if there is anything that awakes us at night, it should be you know, the same thing from happening again. And most importantly, making the same mistake again. That will be unforgivable. So that's why I think this is a great university. 
uh, you, you have to be very active in advocating for the pandemic accord. There are some voices globally who are saying, oh, this pandemic accord, they want to take our sovereignty and so on. This is, to be honest, absurd. This is member states negotiating and it will not take any of their sovereignty. This is actually a very, if, if it succeeds, it will be a very enlightened national interest. You know, national interest will always be there. It will continue to be there. But there is what we call enlightened national interest. And in the pandemic accord, we agree on something, a common problem, we're agreeing to have uh, a common front for a shared problem, a shared approach. And that's an enlightened uh, national interest. But countries will always keep their national interest. And it, it can be, it can be um, uh, balanced. By the way, I have been to Ann Arbor for, uh, this is for my, my third time. Uh, for some reason, I come every six years. The first one was 2011. The second one was 2017, and now 2023. I will break that cycle, maybe come early now, maybe <laughs> very, very uh, soon. Uh, but I, I have benefited from this university when um, I was um, minister. Maybe you will hear me speak later. Um, um, it was Professor Sanait Fasaha, you know her, who connected me with uh, this university. Uh, and uh, the, the other thing which you said, the capacity building is what we benefit from, from this university. Starting a residence program on OBGYN and undergrad support, and a new uh, curriculum in one of our hospitals, a new medical school, and then capacity building in kidney transplant and i can tell you many uh, other initiatives that we have started so you you have a big voice you have a capacity you have credibility to really speak about the pandemic accord um, and we call it a generational agreement and uh, this agreement uh, should succeed and i hope you will give uh, your your best to the success then uh, final, before I ask my question, it's on um, uh, data. I think on data, uh, our approach is, and the approach should be, uh, we need to respect countries. So our approach is to build the capacity of countries to collect data, analyze data, interpret data, and use it. That's critical. Then share, then we have the data hub, like in WHO, to use it globally. Because then we will use it to address our common challenges. If we, if the world is going to be strong, it's very important to decentralize it. Have capacity in each and every country. Not only national level, by the way, we should help them to even increase their subnational and local uh, capacity. Then that brings ownership also. And ownership means they will use it to the, to, to the maximum. And what we want is to use the data at their level and address their problems. If it's maternal mortality, for mater to reduce maternal mortality. If their problem is under five mortality, for that. If it's non-communicable diseases, for that. If it's life expectancy, anything. Whatever challenge they're facing, they can use it. And that's how we should really push it towards. And that's also a shift. Then on data that's associated with my question, uh, there is a concern now globally about chat GPT and use of AI. And some are claiming now that many problems associated with it, even young children or kids are using um, it and concerns related to racism, sexism, uh, something that could, 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 could really hurt our, our in even ch child abuse through that. Of course, I, AI has a lot of benefits, uh, but with chat GPT, I think many are now worried and more of the regulatory part and the ethical should be considered and why without undermining its use 
but at the same time have a balance of uh, moderating it. Maybe uh, Dr. Devoa, yeah? Dev, de, de, de. <laughs> I live in Switzerland and I can't say it. This is. Moise, Moise, Moise is fine. But I'm not sure that Moise is easier. Okay. <laughs> so he's really put together, the boys really put together an international panel. You have to give it to him. Yeah. <laughs> With all the accents that exist. So and it is if, Dubois. So that's, that there, is, there is concern, and I would like to hear from you. I can see your um, passion in, in data, in uh, AI, and um, I would really appreciate it if you can comment on that. What do we do? There is a serious concern now, uh, globally. And they even say misinformation, disinformation could in, even be enhanced with, with, with that, yeah. with, with the chat GP, GPT. Open AI. Uh, uh, and yeah, so uh, many concerns, so that I just wanted. But one ask I have is let's make the pandemic accord really happen. Uh, that's what I, I am really uh, asking you, appealing. It's a generation, uh, generational agreement and it's for the good of us now, and also the uh, incoming generation. Of course, many of you are young. It, it's about you, and it's about others who are coming after you. Thank you, Dean, and back to you. Thank you. Do you want to take a moment to, to comment? We'll have to wrap yeah. up in a few, but you can, uh, if you want to take a moment to comment. Quickly, yes, <laughs> um, No, I mean, so I, I, I run a consortium of different countries, including Latin America and Europe, etc. And because of that, we went for something and we went on ChatGPT in English and then ChatGPT in French. And we asked the same question. And it didn't give us the same answer. You know? Because the sources are not the same. So, and that was interesting. Um, um, so clearly, Universities, even before going to the more uh, serious, are fighting because we had some students who, not, some universities have students where they return papers. They ask ChatGPT, they fill it in ChatGPT, and ChatGPT return the paper. Um, but when you see a lot of papers that are very similar, you figure out that you know maybe there is something there. So the question becomes: Should one have a software like turn it in, you know, that's chat GP, don't chat GPT in kind of thing. Or should one say, okay, you can use chat GPT, but then it's gonna just give you the data and then you have to do the analysis, the thinking in terms of doing it. So I'm not aware of the of the I, I know, but I'm not knowledgeable enough to to uh to be talking about the securities, for example, child abuse and stuff like that, um, about the AI. Uh, but the danger, the danger is there. Um, it will also go depend on what what you feed to it, you know? So for example, you can ask ChatGPT who won the election, who won the last World Cup of football. Real football, you know, soccer, you guys call it, but you know, football where, where you you hit the ball with your foot, you know. So, <laughs> so who won the last World Cup? Doesn't know, because it stopped two years ago. You know, it was right censored. So, I'm. I don't think we can stop ChatGPT, uh, but not ChatGPT AI. Um, the question is whether it's gonna be, how supervised is it gonna be? Uh, is it gonna be completely unsupervised like machine modeling or how supervised is it gonna be? And so I don't know the answer, you know? I think we're in the middle of that experiment. Um, close of the session um, and want to just thank our, our wonderful panelists for their insightful remarks. I'd like to thank Dr. Tedros for his also very 
insightful comments and, and, and question. And then like to just thank all of you here in person uh, for joining us. And then those of you who are also on the live stream as well. So uh, we'll close the session out here. Thank you so much for coming. I do feel inspired. Uh, we've pointed out lots of problems, but looking in the audience, we have lots of brain power here ready to address a lot of these difficult uh, uh, solutions. All right. Thank you. Bye tomorrow. Bye tomorrow. <laughs>